Sports presents the American League champion Minnesota Twins against the National League champion St. Louis Cardinals in game one of the 1987 World Series. The Cardinals clinched the pennant Wednesday night in St. Louis by shutting out the Giants in the decisive seventh game of the playoffs. While the Twins already had their flag in hand by virtue of Monday's clinching victory over the Tigers. And guiding the two teams that got here are one rookie manager and one wily, crafty leader. Benazi Smith and Tommy Herr batting third. Jim Lindemann, rookie first baseman, cleanup. Willie McGee, the veteran. Dave Phillips down the line and left and Lee Wire in right. Now here in Bush Stadium. Smith and Herr, the big three at the top, two for 24. Then Dreeson, the cleanup hitter. McGee hits in the five spot. Ford sixth. Okendo batting seventh. Tony Pena does the catching and John Tudor the pitching. No designated hitter in the games in the National League Park. Unlike in Minnesota where each team could use the DH and we'll be able to if we go back there Saturday and Sunday. As far as the inside pitch is concerned on Les Straker, let's find out from the Milwaukee Brewers Paul Molitor. So he can he can get a little bit I guess unnerved and you could see that in the playoffs. Of yes. course it's a little bit better to pitch here than it is against the Tigers with 225 home runs. If you saw game two, you saw Lee Wire, a National League umpire. He went around the edge of the plate and really unearthed the black edge, what we call the, the black. And the reason he said he did that is because he has a wide strike zone. Greg Cost apparently doesn't have that. Coleman to lead off with a bunt that will bounce. Fielded by Herbeck. No, he doesn't tag him to the disbelief of the Minnesota first baseman, but now they're going to get some help on the play. McSherry is going to confer with Cost. McSherry said no, but now Cost says yes. He's out. Sure looked like it. Looked like he almost knocked him out of the big base path with a tag. Well, well, a base runner also can make his own base path if he's not avoiding the tag. If Coleman went out of the baseline avoiding the tag, then he would have been that called out. It appeared Herbeck touched him anyway. Yeah, well, look, what I said, or what I meant to say was that he knocked him out with a tag, meaning he tagged him so hard. Yeah. Let's Again, see if he goes out of the baselines avoiding the tag anyway, whether he tagged him or not. Well, he definitely got him, even though at first base, McSherry was screened. Even without being asked, he went to Koss for the call. And really, not much of a protest from Whitey. He knew nope. it. Smith takes a strike here and the count one and one. Another view now. Well, Coleman with 14 infield hits, excuse me, 14 bunt hits on the year, 44 infield hits. No doubt Herbeck playing up a couple of steps because you have to do that with guys like Ozzy Smith and Vince Coleman. Otherwise, they're going to bunt. You'll get to the ball and you won't be able to make that play. Smith taking low on the count two and two. Get a better angle right here as to whether Herbeck made the tag or not. Yeah, he tagged him. And it's grounded to the left side and off Gagney's glove. It went by Gaetti and then Gagney tried to backhand it. And he knew he had very little time, even had he come up with it, to get Ozzy Smith. <laughs> well, I always thought that when you when you played in a dome, it was a controlled environment until we went to the Metrodome. <laughs> and we saw 55,000 hysterical people but, but then again 10 runs and eight runs will do it huh. temperature in the low to to mid 40s I think you've touched on something too Jim I think the Cardinal fans and judging from the city walking through it last night going to dinner I think they more or less have a wait and see attitude it's almost like the fans themselves are back on their heels I think you're a thousand percent right as Gaetti takes outside we were here a couple of years ago by contrast after the Cardinals were in Kansas City and had won games one and two and, and the city was alive and downtown filled with banners and music and the whole thing and and granted the off day was a 75 degree sparkling day as Gaetti gets a fly ball to center field McGee gets a late start but turns it into a routine catch and Bernanski will be the batter but coming in here yesterday it was kind of a gray and drizzly day and the, the whole 
day sort of uh, was a reflection of the mood in a way. Yeah, it really was. And that's what 10-1 uh, and 8-4 will do when you're on the short end, I suppose. <laughs> However, it wouldn't take much to get this count turned on. <laughs> right. We've all seen it. Brunanski takes outside ball one, one and oh. They saw it so much of the year with what, over three million people coming out to see the Cardinals. And as we talked about in the first games, 62 and 31 at the All-Star break. Great first half. And another great off-speed pitch by Tudor to make it one and one. Brunanski very unusual in the way he initiates his swing. He holds his bat almost a very stiff fashion. His hands are almost over the plate. You, you won't see any hitter from either side hold his bat like Bernanski holds his bat to start the swing. Well, his weakness has always been really low and away. And, uh, you know, if you go to extremes inside, he has trouble. Maybe it's for plate coverage. Two and two. Mike Ward with the pitch counter. One thing about Tudor, if he's on, he's not going to throw that many. No, oh, he was concerned, though. He was concerned about the cold weather. He said he was going to try hot stuff, analgesic bomb, maybe for the first time in his career tonight. And that's because of the, the fact he had to come back. Off to a very positive start for the Cardinals with five in a row having been retired, and that's his first strikeout. Well, the down and away changeup, and once you throw a fastball, what you do is you you establish that pitch, and then what he does when you throw the changeup, he swings at the arm, like you said, Tim. You, the ball, it's not really the speed of the ball; it's the motion of the arm. And you swing at it, you get out on your front foot, and you get a guy way out in front of the ball. Herbeck hits it up the line, fielded by Tudor, and he gets him. And so Tudor starts by retiring the first six after one and a half, no score in St. Louis. Left the hotel, walked across the street, went to a deli for a turkey sandwich. Went back and watched television. He was going to go to the racetrack. He loves racing. He was going to go to Fairmont Park across the river, but he said, nah, too much hassle. Bottom of the second inning, no score. Dan Dreesen takes a strike in the count on one. Dreesen, McGee, and Ford in the bottom of the second. Danny is being platooned during the World Series with Jim Lindeman at first base. And as you all know, it's Jack Clark's spot. But with Clark gone, Whitey has to make do with what he's got. Dreesen throws it toward the gap in left center field, but Puckett gets a great start and makes the catch. Kirby read it perfectly, was off at the crack of the bat. He's got good speed and takes an extra base hit away from Dan Dreesen. I'll tell you, deceptive speed. Puckett, as you said, out, got a marvelous jump on this ball. He wasn't going full speed, but had control speed when he made the catch. Well, considering where he started from, which was right center, and the reason he's playing over there, the double off the hefty bags and then a fly ball that, that he hit real well. He was swinging the bat very well, so they shift him around where I think he's a left field hitter. McGee, the batter, and the count, one to go. It always seems to me he's been, but that ball slicing away from Puckett. Nice catch. One and one now on Willie McGee with one out of the bases empty. At control speed for an outfielder, it's, it's almost like the kickoff return team on a football team. You, you go hard for about 30 yards, and then you pick up the ball carrier. The same thing for an outfielder. You go hard at first, then pick up the ball. You have to be controlled with your hands because you have to catch the ball before it hits the ground. That's the object. It's not being too simplistic, is it? <laughs> Two one to McGee is over for a strike. <laughs> yeah, the heat is on tonight in the in the Cardinal dugout. In more ways than one, the heat is on for the Cardinals. It's softly to left field, and that will drop in in front of Gladden for a base hit. So Willie McGee is now four for eight in the World Series, and it will bring up Kurt Ford. Talked about Tudor's changeup. Here's Les Strikers, and you can see how Willie McGee is fooled. Good pitch, bad result. 
but again, if you are not a line drive hitter like Willie McGee, and this is why this park is so perfect for him, you try to pull that ball, you get out on your front foot, he just kind of went with it. Not a good swing, but good result. Now Kurt Ford at the plate. Ford, two for three thus far in the series. He was in the starting lineup in game two. Pure left-handed batter. And we say pure because the Cardinals have so many switch hitters, and Ford comes out of that same mold. Quick, speedy, line drive type hitter, but a left-handed batter only. Give you an idea of what kind of pitching park this is. The all-time record for home runs in this ballpark was set this year by Jack Clark at 17, I believe. So not a whole lot of home runs, even though Clark did miss 31 games. Pitching out, but McGee not going in the count of 2-0. and oh. Jack Clark with 35 home runs this year. Only one other Cardinal since this park was built back and finished, actually, back in 1966. Only one other Cardinal has 30 or more home runs. That was Dick Allen back in 1970. Hmm. Intimidating ballpark. Rip to center field, but right at Puckett, who makes the catch. And McGee can't go anywhere. So Ford hits a shot after McGee softly singles, and there are two down in the second inning. And Jose Okendo comes to the plate. Uh, it's funny how hitting is. Jim mentioned that Willie McGee hit a good pitch with a good result. He hit it poorly. Kurt Ford just the opposite. A 2-0 fastball. He hits a rocket to center, but there's Kirby Puckett. So Ford is back on the bench. Talking it over with Tom Pagnazzi, and here is Okendo with two out and another pitch out, and again the Twins pitch out and McGee not going. We, if you watch the playoffs, you you heard so much about the Giants pitching out, taking the Cardinals out of the running game. A, a pitch out is only effective if you do it right. Willie McGee saw right there that Les Straker was pitching out. He broke, saw that it wasn't a normal windup, went back to first base. So what you do is. You put Okendo in a good hitting position. It's 1-0. Straker has to come to him. you got to pitch out. You have to work on it in spring training. There he goes. And there was no pitch. So time had been called. Time had been called. And a walk was called, which was the reason that Kosk had his hand in the air. And we mentioned Straker, five walks, which is the equivalent of about 10 in the National League. The way they're called. And you got to go to Bush Stadium in downtown St. Louis. The Goodyear Blimp coming up from Pompano Beach, Florida. And circling this ballpark on a very chilly night as we go to the third inning with no score. Tim Laudner and going back to game two. John Tudor being wild high. It wasn't wild high, but he did get the ball up and Laudner just spanked it into center field. Not a good pitch with two strikes. Lombardozzi looks in the strike. 0 and 1. Rick Rennick sending down the signs from third. Another thing that Kelly's got to take into consideration here is Lombo is the number eight hitter, and the pitcher is on deck. And that's something that doesn't happen in an American League game. That's why he's not bunning. Right. Popped up in foul ground, and Pena comes over to the dugout and can't make the catch. And that's one of the problems here in St. Louis with those steep and very narrow dugout steps, even though he was coming over towards friendly territory, that has to come into your mind. Tony had the steps gauged correctly, but not the ball. He did kind of look down away from the ball, and the ball actually went between his glove and his chest. Well, I asked the groundskeeper why they did not put a tartan track warning track like they have around the outfield behind home plate, and he said it because of football. But there's so many artificial turf stadiums. You think they could do a zipper thing where they could protect some of their, not only some of the guys sitting on the bench like John Tudor, but some of, as we saw in '85 when Brett went right into the dugout yeah. here. If nothing else, at least to, to let you know there's a difference, so you can feel it with your feet. That well, you're see, on they the say that the, the groundskeeper said it gets slippery, and uh, you can see that, as you said, when in the opening, you can see the moisture that collects under the tarp sometimes here. Ball strike three. So Lombardozzi goes down on strikes. Tudor has his second strikeout. And Les Straker will be coming to the plate. 
Here it was, that play in April against the Mets, the little pop-up off Jack Clark's bat. Barry Lyons went over, and into the dugout he went. And the next thing you know, John Tudor is back in the clubhouse at the hospital and on the DL for three months. Straker now at the plate. Straker, Tudor, lifetime, hitting 170, has never hit a home run. Only well, struck out six times and 40 times up, so he is a contact hitter for a pitcher. Seven base hits, four for 13 in scoring position, so it looks like he concentrates a little bit better with runners on. And Tudor goes down on strikes, and with one out, Vince Coleman coming to the plate and talking about the importance of getting the Cardinal running game going. Well, that's true. You know, I, I tend to, you know, I take that in a phase to say that, you know, if I'm locked up in a room one-on-one, -on -one, that I'll come out on top. And I like to, you know, uh, go into every game to think that uh, it's always a challenge that I have to get on base. Uh, I feel if I do get on base four or five times, steal three or four bases, score four or five runs, then we're going to win ball games. And the man they call Vincent Van Gogh has been Vincent Van No because he hasn't been getting on in the World Series. One for nine, and he was certainly stymied by the Giants in terms of stealing bases in the playoffs. Well, Tim and I were talking yesterday from a pitcher-catcher standpoint, and the difference between Coleman and a normal runner, really, that's something you can relate to, Al, is like... As he grounds it to short, and there's Dagny backhanding and then throwing it away. Bouncing off the auxiliary box and right back to Herbeck to one base. And to finish that thought, it's, it's really the, it's something you can relate to. It's the difference between when you travel by air going commercial or charter. You can go anytime you want to. <laughs> and Vince Coleman certainly can go anytime he wants to once he gets there. But look what he causes before he gets there. He causes the bad throw by Gagney, that in-between hop. And Coleman's on first, and you can look for him to run. So he only gets first base because the ball caromed back and was always in play. There he goes. Smith takes a strike, and the throw is backed up after Vince Steele's second. contended that a hitter who puts the bat intentionally in front of the catcher is interfering with the catcher. There was no intent right there, and that, of course, is the judgment of the umpire. There's no intent whatsoever by Ozzie Smith but to block Loudner out of the play. It's perfectly legal, and nobody ever calls it. You never see it called, but Ozzie, no intention to bunt. He put the bat head in front of the catcher, and Loudner couldn't get out there and get a good jump to make a good throw. Aged for that clean, crisp taste, this bud's for you. Fourth inning with no score. Well, the 1964. Oh, Cardinal, that's a well-worn button. Tim McCarver would know all about that. It's a great ball club. Kenny Boyer at third. Kenny was the MVP that year. Bob Gibson, of course, Ray Sadecki, Kurt Simmons, Dick Grote, Julian Javier. And here it is 23 years later in the Cardinals. Down two games to nothing as they face the Twins in the fourth. Now, the Twins in this series have already scored 13 runs in the fourth inning of the two games. What's interesting is that is the record for most runs by one team in one inning. As you can see, there are seven teams that share it. The fascinating thing is the Twins have done it in two games. That's total runs in one inning in the total series. So Minnesota was seven in the fourth inning of game one and six in the fourth inning of game two to effectively end all of the office pools summarily. Pocket. Loops one to Tommy Hurt. So Kirby is gone here in the fourth. And it will bring up Gary Gaetti, who flied out in the second inning. 
Well, they asked Whitey after the first two games, what do you think we should do to make this series fair? He said, take the roof off and don't let them bat in the fourth. <laughs> The other night, Gladden's grand slam punctuated the fourth inning in game one. As Gaetti fouls it back. And then in game two, game two's fourth inning ended with an out. Gagne grounded out. And then Minnesota still went on to score six. One strike to count. Gaetti from Centralia, Illinois, and a big Cardinal fan growing up. Used to come to Bush Stadium a lot. He said last night, Tim, that he, he grew up dreaming about playing in the World Series at Bush Stadium, but in a different uniform. Uh huh. <laughs> the bat winds up near Ozzie. Two and two. Well, you just know if you're a hitter two and one, you're going to get a pretty good pitch to hit a fastball. And then what does Tudor do? Pulls the string, throws the changeup. Right there, looking fastball, gets the bat head out, all the way to shortstop. Dr. Crank. Something we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, Jim, in the Detroit Toronto game at the end of the season. And, you know, I think youngsters in baseball grow up throwing the curveball ahead in the count and the fastball when they're behind. And there's a fastball with a count even, and he gets it, and he fooled him. And that's one strike to Dan Dreesen in the count 0-1. Dreesen, McGee, and Ford, no score. In the air to left field, Dan Gladden is right there. One away. So Dreesen has flied out twice, one gone. Cardinals have been limited to two hits, a scratch single by Smith. And a looping single by McGee. And up comes Willie. Well, the key to Les Straker so far is that he has gotten the first batter in each inning. Only one walk. So the things that really cost him five runs and four walks, uh, three hits in the playoffs against Detroit have not really been evident tonight. Again, a lot easier to pitch here at Bush Stadium than in Tiger Stadium against a team that uh, had 225 home runs, led the major leagues in that category for the year. One and one on Willie McGee. By the way, if you're scoring, Tony Pena was given an error on the foul pop that he couldn't handle off the bat of Lombardozzi in the third. Didn't do any damage. Lombardozzi eventually struck out. But each team with one error. Two and two. Les Straker out of Venezuela. Fascinating story. Pitched in the minor leagues for 10 years. Thought about quitting from time to time. His wife told him to just stick with it, hang in there. And at the age of 28, he's a rookie. McGee hits one deep to right and down the line into the corner and off the wall. Played perfectly by Brunanski. McGee has a double. There are almost no left-handed hitters who can handle the ball down and in. A slider to Willie McGee down and in. And the theory is all you have to do is drop your bat head. You really don't have to generate any bat speed to hit that pitch. And that's why it's the most dangerous pitch from a right-handed pitcher to a left-handed hitter. We'll be back with game four of the 1987 World Series after this word from Major League Baseball and a message from your local station. with Ozzie Smith taking the field with his typical flourish and as the Minnesota Twins come up tonight they'll line up this way Dan Gladden leading off 
who was forced out of his last appearance at Candlestick Park in the playoffs with a strained thigh muscle. Quadricep in his right leg, the one he lands on, not the one he pushes off. So and that's 10 days ago. So he should, you know, control, control pitcher. And there you saw the curveball. Excuse me, Al. That is one difference. Tudor has one, but only threw it to Herbeck last night. You will see his curveball along with a slider, along with a change of the fastball, and he'll throw it to right-hand hitters. Glad Newman and Bucket in the first inning. Glad takes a strike on the outside corner. John McSherry has a pretty wide strike zone. McSherry is back at the plate. He's from the National League. Ken Kaiser at first base. Jerry Tata at second as Black swings and misses. Dave Phillips is the umpire at third. Lee Wire down the line in left, and Greg Cox will be down the line in right. One ball, two strikes to count on Dan Gladden in his first year as a twin. Traded from the Giants in the spring. Change missing away. Two and two the count. Pitches inside a lot more than John Tudor, and, and the way he does that is with both his fastball and his slider. But the key to hitting him, even for the power hitters of the Twins, is to hit the ball up the middle. You can't pull away and hit that change up away. You just won't get to it. And down he goes. He turned it over. So Matthews starts with a strikeout. Latin gone here in the first inning. And Al Newman is the batter. Again, look at his front shoulder. Now he's throwing the fastball. He is open. By the time the ball gets there, he's swinging at that arm that looks like it. It's the same speed as, as if you're throwing a fastball way out in front on your front foot. Very tough to hit this one during the regular season. And the middle of the order for Minnesota is Gary Gaetti, Tom Brunansky, and Ken Herbeck. Matthews had a 1 2 3 first. Gaetti 4 for 12 in the series. Curve low and in, 1 0. Oh. Greg Matthews didn't think about baseball very much as a kid played it but never considered playing it professionally. Gaetti squibs it up the line one and one. He grew up in Anaheim and he he liked to surf and, and just have a good time and he wound up going to Santa Ana College and as we mentioned at the top he was drafted by the twins in 1982 and didn't sign. He wanted to get an education and didn't feel that eight to ten thousand dollars was enough. And then blossomed at Cal State Fullerton. Had a, a good year there in 84 early on, then was injured and faded a bit at the end. And even his college coach was surprised that he was drafted. He was picked by the cards in the 10th round. Well, I could understand that because if you look at him, he is, does not have great physical ability in the sense that he has a great arm, but he is an accomplished pitcher at 25 years of age. And the reason he got optioned out this year is that he went last year to to work with Steve Carlton, a guy that you caught for years. And he be, tried to throw mechanically like Carlton, more upright. And he just couldn't do it. It wasn't effective. Gaetti gets hit by the pitch. It grazed him. And so on a 1-2 pitch, the Twins get the leadoff man on here in the second inning with Gary at first base and nobody out and Tom Brunansky coming up. Well, Matthew Good. certainly doesn't want to do this. Right As a matter of fact, Brunansky. this pitch is just to show Gaetti, I would imagine, the fastball inside, and then he would go back outside, and the ball just nicks his shoulder. He did not hit a batter during the entire regular season in 197 innings. Well, that's what 10 days off will do. Sometimes, uh, again, a control pitcher, you're not quite as sharp, and you try to come inside, and you come in too, too far. Now, talking about the uh, the pickoff move, and Paul Molitor, or excuse me, Tony Gwynn talked about the fact that San, uh, San Francisco must have seen something. His one bad tendency, and he has been able to pick two guys off, is that he throws the ball too softly to first. So what they try to do in the National League is just go on his first move. Even if he throws to first, they're going to try to beat the throw to second base, and it's been successful, especially for the Giants. Gaetti at first base. Gary does not run very much. One and oh the count. And it's a towering fly ball to shallow center field. Her goes all the way out and camps under it for the out. 
Tommy second foot out. Gaetti remains at first with one down. And Ken Herbeck is the batter. Gaetti six, number 14. First baseman, Ken Herbeck. We said Gaetti doesn't run very much. They do a lot of hit and running with him, so he wound up with a decent number of steals, 10. He was caught seven times, but he is not what you would classify as a real threat to go in this situation in a straight steal sense. Herbeck takes high ball one. What a go. It's funny how organizations uh, that, that don't have the uh, the image of running a lot. As a matter of fact, Dan Gladden with 25 stolen bases this year, the most for a twin player since Rod Carew had 27 back in 1978. There he goes. It swung on and missed, and the throw down a second doesn't get him. On the hit and run play. And I, I don't think Pena really saw and anticipated Gaetti running. A lot of times the pinch helps you out, but Herbeck, a left-handed hitter, and your catcher can't see around the left-handed hitter, but you're supposed to anticipate every play, and Tony really taking a long time getting rid of that ball, and that's why Gaetti has his first stolen base in postseason play. And the count on Herbeck is one and two, so we'll see if Kent can cash him in. On deck is Tim Laudner. And also the position of where the ball is. You know, Timmy, ball away is much easier. You can see the runner more readily. That ball's up and in and kind of blinded him to the runner in scoring position. Just gets a piece of it. So still a ball and two strikes. Whitey Herzog. Looking on as his club tries to get even. And if they do, it means a guaranteed sixth game Saturday in Minnesota. That gets away from Pena, who can't find it. And down to third goes Gaetti. I tell you, Tony looked like he was crossed up on that pitch by the way he went after the ball. He didn't turn his glove over. See how he stabs at the ball? He goes down and now can't pick it up, and Lawless has to field it, and it's going to go as a wild pitch, and Pena out there talking to Matthews. You see how he goes after that ball? Usually when a catcher goes down after a ball like that, in that particular fashion, it's a cross-up, and Pena talking to Matthews, I would assume that's what it was. And the Twins get a man to third on a hit batsman, a missed hit and run that results in a steal, and a wild pitch. And the Cardinal infield plays in. Three and two to count. Sounds more like a Cardinal scoring opportunity yeah, than it, a twin. It does. A St. Louis rally. Diane at third. Three and two to count. And he gets it. Down. As we said, 25 years of age, only his second year in the major leagues. And Mike Rock, Rourke, I would call him a hands-on pitching coach. As always, he talked to John Tudor at length. Maybe has a little bit of advice. Pitching pretty well so far. And Pena listening in as well. As I think you know, probably talking about that cross-up that you were talking about, Timmy. Maybe trying to get the sign straightened out it makes the job a lot easier for both the pitcher and the catcher, especially in late innings when it's in a close ball game. Bottom of the second inning with no score. Jim Lindeman to lead off, McGee and Pena to follow. When Viola pitched game one, he allowed just five hits in eight innings, two by Lindeman, including a fly ball double that dropped in front of Puckett that led to the Cardinals' only run. Lindemann had two of the hits, and McGee, who's on deck, had two hits against Viola. One and one. And with the Cardinal lineup missing Terry Pendleton and Jack Clark, that's really what you try to do as a pitcher. You try to space the hit. The only way the Cardinals are going to score any runs, at least the theory by which you go, is to bunch hits three in a row, three out of four. That's how they're going to score runs. 
where the Twins can get a guy on and pop one out of the ballpark. You can't really anticipate that with a Cardinal lineup. And that is the way the Cardinals have been for years, and they're constructed to play in this ballpark. Spacious Bush Stadium. As the writer Art Spander of San Francisco said, the only grand slam the Cardinals know about is in contract bridge. Seven no trouble, <laughs> right? Hit foul. And it's two and two. Well, that's why Viola really has an edge against this lineup. A big ballpark. Holds runners on well. And as Molitor said, the only problem he has at second base. It's a lot easier to steal third than it is to steal from first to second. And down goes Lindemann. Good fastball. So two strikeouts for Viola. He fanned Coleman starting first. Lindemann here in the second. And up comes William McGee. A ball position in the glove with the two fingers. Looks like a cross seam fastball. And what makes him so tough is that his fastball is well over 90 miles per hour. So you have the curveball, the changeup, he'll throw at any time. You can't sit on one pitch. And any hitter will tell you that makes hitting very difficult. One out, base is empty, and McGee wraps it in the center base hit. So Willie has Viola's number, his third hit off Frank, and McGee having a good series is now six for 12. Tony Pena coming up. Pena making a great play yesterday. This coming in the sixth inning, going right to the edge of the dugout and in. And talk about a big out. Talk about living on the edge. That's <laughs> what he did there. Yeah. He can die on the edge here in these dugouts. Breaking pitch, missing, and the count one and zero. Look for McGee to run right here. Pena hits the ball well the other way, and the Cardinals have to put their runners in motion in order to score runs. They cannot play a passive game. Ideal time to do it because the Twins probably won't pitch out. It's one and zero. It takes a lot of guts to pitch out when you're behind in the count. And it's two and zero now. So Pena steps out for a look at McLeva at third. Vince Coleman, meanwhile, is getting as good a perspective as he can as he moves down to the edge of the dugout. He does that often to get a better peek at a pickoff move. Well, he hasn't been able to get on first, so this is the best perspective that he has, at least not off of Viola. What kind of move was that, Jim? That's a strange move right there. With it. There was no lead kick. Well, that's what he did on the pitch before, and he knows as you said that McGee may run so what he's trying to do is cut down on the leg kick both when he goes to first and home and that's a very short leg kick for somebody that's six four now that's not the leg kick you will see with nobody on first base it'll be a lot higher or somebody on first base that can't run Willie McGee did not run only 16 stolen bases this year because of the knee injury and then the, the surgery that he had during the offseason Coming back in mid-April. 3-0. Pena taking looks at the strike, and it's three and one with Okendo on deck. I'll tell you, there's a dramatic difference in the leg kick of Frank Viola and the leg kick of Greg Matthews, for instance. Viola just shuffles that right leg forward, and Matthews takes it all the way back as if he were warming uh, or winding up. He goes and it's drilled toward the gap and left center field. Puck is charging in. They have to short hop it. And McGee stops at second. So the Cardinals with two on and one out. McGee had to hold up even though he was going to see if Puckett would catch it. So he has to stop at second with one gun. A ball off the end of the bat. And I don't really think Willie McGee knew where Puckett was playing. Puckett looked like he faked, but not a great fake. Uh, he was out in right center field because we've seen Pena drive the ball and hit the ball between first and second. But Puckett gives him the fake. McGee falls for it. And instead of first and third, 
And a fly ball scoring the run. You still got a double play in order. Ground ball can get you out of the inning. Jose Okendo. Taking ball one. Okendo last night got the seventh inning started with a base hit. Now, Willie slows up before he gets to second base. I agree with you, Jim. I think Puck had made a good play once the ball did bounce. But Willie should have been a little more aggressive on the bases. Two and over the count. The first responsibility a base runner has is to turn around and check all the outfielders and see how deep they are. And to echo that thought, I don't think Willie did that. The ball did fool him a little bit. And but a case could be made that he should be on third base right now. And where he was playing, Puckett was playing him over toward the gap in right center. Yeah. To deep left center field. Black goes all the way back and makes the catch. And the runners have to hold. When it left the bat, it looked like it had a chance, but it just died. And Gladden able to race back and make the play. Go to your blimp a thousand feet above Bush Stadium, the Goodyear Blimp Enterprise, piloted by Richard Daniels. High above eight with the temperature in the mid 40s. Range record. Well, the double-A ball back in 1982. But caught 11 times, and uh, I think a lot of that has to do with an experience. Really, he's never had a chance to yeah. play. Didn't get to play in Montreal that much. He's a backup infielder this year. They wanted him to, to really hit from the left side, and that was that's where his bad numbers are from. So he will be a much better base runner as he learns the pitchers, learns more about base running. Do a lot of things in the minors you can't do in the major leagues. Newman held on by Lindemann. Two down, one nothing twins in the third. 0 and 1. And you talked about Puckett struggling. The first ball he has really driven sharply to the left side was the ball he lined out the left field. Looked like a fastball that Matthews got up and in inside part of the plate. They pitched him away. They played him that way. And other than the ball that Kurt Ford tried to hold to a double that went for triple last night, it really hasn't hit the ball that hard. So he's got his hits, but they've only been soft singles to right field. And that looping double. Toward the hole, corralled by Smith, who goes to her for the fourth. Nice play by Tommy. So in the inning, the Twins take the lead on the home run by Gagney, and after two and a half, Minnesota won, St. Louis nothing. You have the handle, but how hard it's thrown from a very short distance. And that's why it was a good play by Tommy Herr, what he had to do. Good play. So that end of the top of the third, and now in the bottom of the third, Matthews grounds to short, and Matthews can barely run, so he just jogged down to first base on the grounder to Gagne. And if you're thinking about that thigh problem, it was quite in evidence as Matthews moved down to first base. That's the first time he's made an out in postseason play. Two for two with two sacrifices before that at bat. That coming in game one of the National League Championship Series, the night Danny Cox couldn't make it to the post, and Matthews got the call, won the game, and did the job with a bat, two-run single, and a couple of sacrifices that night. Coleman now looks at a strike. Just jogging. Half swing foul and it's 0-2. It's not the way it's supposed to be done. And you don't, he's been around long enough where you try to run those balls out. I mean, at least with a little more effort, I'd have to assume that his leg is bobbing a little bit. 
And as we've said, Al, I mean, it's 40 degrees at game time, 47. Wind chill around 40 degrees. And it's supposed to go down a little bit lower. 0-2 oh, to Coleman. Breaking pick. Line to right field. Andrew Nansky. And he makes the catch. Tom Brunansky. During the course of the regular season, he makes a lot of catches like that. He has the knack of gauging low-sinking line drives, going to his knees and making the play. And the reason that outfielders will slide on the rug like that is because when they slide, it is a timing play. And by sliding the gloves down there, that's why they prefer that as opposed to bending from the waist. He's got that moved down to a science. Yeah. What makes that play even better is that if the ball gets by him, that's the, the score is tied. I mean, no doubt about it. Coleman will circle the bases. <laughs> I only saw one guy that I think could run fast, and that was Willie Davis. Dropped a bunt down in Miami. The overthrew first, and he was coming by, by home before you could know. It was unbelievable. Long, beautiful stride. Coleman, a little choppy step, but gets the job done the same way. I don't think I ever saw anybody go from first to third faster than Willie Davis. All-time Dodgers center fielder. One and two of the count. Well, we showed we showed the Jim Palmer highlight as you look at the graph on Frank Viola, mainly fastballs through two. Showed Palmer's 66 World Series triumph, but that one World Series Willie Davis would love to forget. Well, that's what we said in the production meeting. I said they said you beat Koufax. I said I'd beat beat Koufax. Willie Davis beat Koufax. Dropped two fly balls in a row and then want to let everybody know that he couldn't catch the ball, but he has a good arm, so he picked it up and threw it in the third base stance. See you later, Sandy. Smith looping it foul, and it's still two and two on Ozzie with two down, and the base is empty in the bottom of the third inning in game four, one nothing Minnesota. John McNamara, who was in the World Series last year, is the manager of the Boston Red Sox. Looking on tonight, and along with Haywood Sullivan and the rest of the front office, probably thinking about a couple of trades. There is one man who is not on the trading block, Herbie Puckett. There'll be an uprising in Minneapolis yeah, well, if he were traded. He checks and the pitch just missing in the count three and two. Burrow and Bono and Smith can keep it alive. Frank Viola to 117 during the regular season. And Smith gets on. So a two down. Ozzy Smith at first base. And a threat to go. Smith second on the club and steals to Coleman. He had 43. Tommy Herr has been about as cold as the weather through the playoffs in the World Series. Again, Herr is a better right-handed batter, 297 this year. From the right side. Strike. And I talked about that point last night. I thought a lot of his problems were unfamiliarity with the other pitchers. He said everybody has the same problem. He said he feels he's hitting the ball sharply, and he hit the ball hard off Viola twice in Minnesota. Nothing to show for it. One and one. I think with the quick move that he has, you really have to take a gamble. You have to go on his first move. If he's gone to home plate as he has on the first two pitches, you got a chance. Otherwise, he's got a good enough move where it's going to be real hard, I think, to pick something up and run on his move. You're just going to have to go on that first move and hope that Lobner doesn't make a good throw. There he goes. Good jump and a little looper in the center for a base hit. Smith will go to third. Well, that was not a hit and run. That was a, a matter of Ozzie Smith running and Tommy Herr hitting it. There's really no advantage.
to no percentage to putting on a hit and run with two out because one of the reasons that you put the hit and run on is to get the runner to third base. And this particular situation with two out, you still need, for the most part, a base hit to score Smith for third. If nobody out or one out, then you do employ the hit and run. But that was just a matter of Smith running, Tommy Hurd choosing a good pitch and smacking. Jim Lindemann now, two on, two out, takes a strike. Lindemann struck out, Viola blew him away with a fastball in the second inning after Lindemann had picked up a couple of hits in game one off Viola. Smith at third, and her at first, held on by Herbeck. Into left field, base hit, game is five. After three innings from going any farther out in San Francisco in the fifth game, goes a little bit farther tonight, but has to leave, and we will see Bob Forsh. So Forsh comes on in relief, and let's get the inside pitch on Bob Forsh from Tony Gwynn of the San Diego Padres. Bob Forsh is an experienced pitcher. He knows how to pitch. He mixes his pitches well. Two balls and no strikes to Tim Laudner, and now it is three and oh with Gagne on deck. So two down, fourth inning, game tied, 1-1, and Brunanski at second base. Porsche, a Cardinal since 1974, and again, a 3-0 green light, and it's fouled away, 3-1. Most action Lance Johnson seen this World Series. <laughs> Dodgeball. It's a dangerous place to dug out sometimes. Breaking pitch misses. Force when he threw it over, but Lautner draws the walk. That walk would be charged to Matthews. Since Force inherited the count of 2-0. And, oh, and it will bring up Greg Gagney, who homered Greg deep Gagne. into the seats and left in the third inning. You're exactly right about Bob Forch. The grand slam he gave up in the first game. Let's take a look at Matthews' 2-0 pitch to Greg Gagne that he just jolted into the seats. Crushed it. Yes, he did. It was a hanging slider, so he does not have good enough stuff to make a lot of mistakes. When he does, he's in trouble. Missing away, one to the count. Gagne with seven hits in postseason play, three homers, four doubles. One and one. And that's the pitch right there that's going to be successful. Everything he throws has to be down in the strike zone, and he has to be on the corners. If he's in the middle of the plate, it's not going to be effective. Won 154 game major league ball games. Two of them no hitters. Once against the Phillies, once against the Expos. One and two. So much like John Tudor last night, Pena moves, gives him a target low and away, and look where the ball is. He gets the ball there. He could be very tough on the Twins because a lot of right-handed hitters, as we said. One and two. 37-year-old Bob Forge picking up for Matthews. And trying to quell a twin threat in the fourth. Two balls, two strikes. Viola on deck, and as is their custom, two and two, the rally caps in the Minnesota dugout. Used to ward off evil spirits, like we two, two, lone away sliders. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Those are evil, I agree. That's what he got, too. 
It didn't ward off that baby. And at the end of three and a half, wins one, Cardinals one. When two didn't pay off, it is explained by second baseman Al Newman. Okay. Two two slider to the six to seven. And the game is tied as we go to the bottom of the fourth inning in Kenya. Starts things off with a count one and zero. Pena, Okendo, and Lawless facing Frank Viola. Tony singled in the second. He's three for ten in the series, and it's two and zero. It's interesting to watch Kirby Puckett in center field playing the count. He was over into right center. And now with the count 2 and 0, Pena more inclined to hit the ball straight away. But Kirby playing the count. And that's one thing I've noticed about watching Kirby Puckett playing center field. He does that as well as anybody. And you don't see a lot of outfielders do that anymore. 3 and 0 the count. And the reason he does that, and, and you're exactly right, I picked on that maybe because I, I don't think it's that obvious. A guy who was a great hitter, Larry Heisel, impressed me and I I think when watching a player when you see him do that you know he's heads up not only offensively but on defense which is such an important part of the game because he knows Viola does not want to walk the leadoff hitter whether it's Payne or anybody and he loses Tony so Payne draws the walk it is the first time tonight the Cardinals have gotten the leadoff man on and Jose Okendo the number seven hitter comes up I guess really to simplify that that thought, when a hitter is ahead in the count, he's more inclined to pull the ball. When a hitter is behind in the count, for instance, no balls and two strikes, he's more inclined to hit the ball the other way. Okendo taking just off the plate. Viola thought he was going to get the call, but Sherry moved that right arm. John has a tendency to do that a lot. You get a lot of half balls. Came in with a very conservative lead at first. And that's over. And it's one and one. Frank Viola working on three days rest. There it was during the regular year, 474 ERA, and just about two runs less with normal rest. He might see it in his control. He didn't walk anybody that first night. He's already walked two, only averaged about 2.4 walks per inning this year. his 63rd pitch and all you have to do with three innings in the books is go 63 times three he'd be on 189 pitch pace so he's on a lot of pitches so far too many it's a very simple game if you watched the game last night and something you talked about in your opening Timmy if the game stay close the advantage goes to the Cardinals because Reardon Baron Gear, Atherton do not hold runners well. And as we've talked about all series, the strength of the Cardinals with Clark and Pendleton out is their running attack. The right, the wrong guys get on, or the right guys get on, depending which way you look at it, it's going to be a track meet. Two and one now in Okendo. Nobody out. Pena in first base in the bottom of the fourth inning. Two balls and one strike count the ideal hit and run count. So you may see Payne in motion. He bluffs going and is lined in the right center for a base hit. He's on his way to third and in there with nobody out. The runner at first base is not compelled to get a good jump. Therefore, he cautiously breaks off a of first base. He picks up the ball. Okendo lifts it into right center. And now you have a first and third. Nobody out situation. 
Watch how Pena just cautiously breaks off at first. The runner in first base, it's not a stolen base that he's attempting. He does not have to get a good jump. However, it's up to the hitter to make contact. And that's what Okendo, Okendo did. Now Lawless takes a strike. Lodner bluffs going to third. The Twins' bullpen will get busy. With the go-ahead run, Pena at third. And Okendo at first. And nobody out. had been done working the last inning in two thirds and Coleman knows him well Shatter in the National League with Montreal and with Philadelphia and with San Francisco so the Cardinals know him well oh such an unusual year good record at three and one but 64 hits in 43 innings what a cute comment he said I wish I had an excuse like a sore arm but there isn't one but very good in postseason play. And that's in there. And Smith has gone on strikes. So Ozzy gets handcuffed despite 12 for 27 lifetime against Chasseter. Second baseman. Second Tom out Herr. in the fourth inning. And Tommy Hur is the batter. 4 1 Cardinals. We mentioned that Lawless is her stands. And Lawless had hit one home run in his major league career. He did it back in 1984. When he was playing for Cincinnati, he did it at Atlanta, and he hit the home run off Ken Daly, who is now his teammate. And one of the first ones out of the dugout. Yep. So Daly has seen all of Lawless's home runs. 
One slightly more exciting than the other. Well, there's something to swinging hard and having a guy on the hill like Daly or Viola that can throw hard. Because that was not, you know, it was an all-one count. If you take a look at Kenny Daly, he was ahead in the count. You know, not really looking for a pitch as we saw earlier off Greg Matthews, Greg Gagne. Amazing that he'd get that kind of bat speed because he's a contact hitter, hits the ball the other way, and all of a sudden he's gone off the facade for a three-run dinger. He did have double figures in home runs once in the minor leagues. His high was 13. One and the count on Tommy Hur. Before tonight, I guess Tom Lawless's greatest claim to fame is that he was traded for Pete Rose back on August 16, 1984. Well, the Reds in that deal had to give Montreal something. Cincinnati wanted Pete to come over not only as a player, but the playing manager. So Lawless went the other way. Huge jump by Coleman. Lardner has no chance, and it's backed up by Gagnon. So a steal for Bench, and the count is 2-0 and on her with Lindemann on deck. Well, this is what seeing a guy, he knows the move. It's elementary. I mean, not a chance for Tim Wadner. Gagney backing up, keeps him at second base. See him drop his arm. He was, was trying to get rid of the ball so quickly. One step. Yeah. The result was high and away and a stolen base. So he's behind Tommy Hur, 2-0. With Coleman in scoring position. 3 0 now. The one thing in baseball, you really can't control speed. I mean, it changes everything. Pitcher releasing the ball, players trying to make the play more quickly, catchers trying to throw. Middle infielders, your second baseman, shortstop moving around. Yep. Now, ball four is intentional, and Lindemann will come up. Negro is still throwing in the bullpen. One thing that Kelly can think about is if he wants Shatsider to hit to lead off in the fifth inning, Shatsider is an excellent First hitting baseman. pitcher. 253 Jim. career average yeah. with five home runs. And the last American League pitcher to get a hit in the World Series, Tim Stoddard back in the 1979 Series. Since that time, American League pitchers have gone 0 for 62. There go the runners, and it's fouled at the plate. Coleman got a huge jump, and Hurl was trailing and going down to second. But the count is 0-1. And that hit by Stoddard was a big hit in Pittsburgh. Well, it was. Uh, we were, I was on that team, and we were coming back, and Lowenstein had doubled. Take a look at Vince Coleman. You, as you said, the reason you can get that huge jump is because nobody's behind you. But anyway, going back to that base hit, Lowenstein, Crowley come from behind. And in that inning, the Stan House, if you take a look at Joe Negro, is warming up in the bullpen, led the team, set an all-time record for saves. And we relieved Stoddard, and he gets the only hit in the history of, the, you know, during the DH and whatever American League's pitchers hitting. It's amazing. Tim Stard, of course, played on that NCAA championship team, 32 and nothing down at basketball team we're talking about. Huge guy at 6'6". North Carolina State with David Thompson. There goes Coleman. It's ripped into left center for a base hit. Coleman scores. Struggles by Puckett. Her will stop at third. Lindemann to second. <laughs>
pitcher, Tony Pena. A whitey ball. Make contact, get the ball back up the middle. What Willie McGee does so well, Puckett keeps him from getting his 12th triple of the year. You get an idea that not only can he hit, he can run. In the air to center field, off Pena's bat as the Cardinals send 10 men to the plate. And again, it's the bottom of the fourth, except this time in St. Louis. Seven to one Cardinals. Instruction. This is what Al, Al Newman's going to do this this offseason. He said he's so disappointed the way he's hit left-handed that he's thinking about not only getting the film but going out to the school. Wants to work with Rod. Pretty good guy to mm, over 3,000 hits to work with. One and one on Newman. Infield double play depth, and it's two and one. It's so apparent that Bob Force is struggling with his control. That's why they had the bullpen up. That's why Mark Mike Rourke went out. Whitey Herzog knows it as well as we do. Two and two. strike zone and the ball runs back now it's not where Pena was sitting but it's where John McSherry the umpire is sitting so he gets a good view of it Pena did not catch it really the way you'd like to in three oh, minutes but right. runners at first and third and puck it grounds it knocked down by Lawless and that's all he can do the twins get another run as Larkin crosses the plate. So all Lawless could do is knock it down. Puckett will get an infield single and a run batted in, and it's seven to two. Well, unusual place for Puckett to hit the ball. He's been hitting the ball the other way, and he saves the double. As Al said, there's no way he is going to make a play on that ball, but by knocking it down, he does keep double play in order. Ground ball will get four shot of this inning if he can throw it. And it's hit at somebody. Preferably not an outfielder. Gary Gaetti at the plate. Cardinals on top, seven to two. One out. One and oh. This game not over by a long shot. I mean, this is the same ball club that came back from a five-nothing deficit in game three of the ALCS. Mm -hmm. Against the Tigers, only to lose when Pat Sheridan hit a home run to win a seven-six. Two and the count. <laughs> 
Around it toward the hole. Ozzie can knock it down, throw, and get him. Ozzie Smith. You look at a play like that, and you say, he can't make that play, and then you realize who's making it. You say, oh, yeah, he can. Watch his throwing position. Oh, mercy. What a play. That's why he's the best. I mean, this tells it all. Not only did he get, get to the ball, and then the acrobatic throw, hers there. Amazing. State of the art. Brunansky takes that side. Or maybe he deflects it to the outfield. That's all he can do with it. You're sure of it when it leaves the bat. And the next thing you know, four's out in second. Strike, one and one. It's amazing, and I've said, we've all seen Ozzy for a long time for the last decade. It's amazing how he smothers the ball by putting the glove on the ground and still maintains contact with the ball. Keeps the ball in the glove. Two and one. Two down. With Dan Gladden, the runner at third. And Gaetti at first. Seven two St. Louis. Line to left. In comes Coleman. Makes the play. Seven to two St. Louis. Negro made his big league debut in 1967. And here he is finally in the World Series. And he's greeted by an Okendo drive to right caught by Brunanski. One pitch and one out. And here comes Lawless. Third baseman, Tom Lawless. The ultimate extra man in 1987. It's and almost, the man of the moment right now. Pardon me, Alex. It's almost the smallest banner in the ballpark, too. <laughs> but the biggest hit. I think they just made it up. <laughs> there might be a few here tomorrow night. Uh, you got that right. One and one. There are a few bed sheets in the Mound City being spray painted as we speak. One and two. Look. Another look at that three-run blast, and it was, considering who hit it. Second career home run. Maybe six to eight feet above the wall. And that home run try, that's one of those visual images burned into the brains of a lot of baseball fans. We won't forget that. That was a classic. Three and two. I guess the most vivid, Carlton Fisk's 11th inning home run in 1975. And I think Tom's may go down with Pudges. A looper to Newman for the out. So two down here in the bottom of the fifth inning. And Bob Force comes up. So one veteran facing Pitcher another. Bob Force. Joe Necro appearing in the World Series for the first time. And his brother, Phil, Never had the opportunity. So what a draft for the, the Negro boys, but Joe finally makes it. He came close, Negro, with Houston in 1980 when they lost in that tremendous five-game series to the Philadelphia Phillies. Not only that, he had to pitch the extra game, the 163rd game. He pitched against the Dodgers to win it. And a lot of people think because Negro wasn't available to start against the Phillies, that's why Houston lost it. That's Pretty a good, good point. Case. That's a good point because, as I recall, that year, too, they had that extra game on Monday. Right. And then the playoffs started on Tuesday, so the rotation was really out of whack. Houston went into Los Angeles. They had to win one game of the weekend. They lost three in a row and then won on Monday afternoon. One hopper to Gagney, and it's a 1-2-3 inning for Joe Nico. Ron Lindemann shovels to McRae. Nice play for the out. One gun here in the first inning. So they keep Gladden off the base pass, and he'll bring up Gagney. 
triple. That was a triple yesterday, Timmy. You see, this is almost the same swing, same ball, maybe a little bit more to the right of the bag, but instead of Greason being there, Lindemann is there and smothers the ball and makes a nice play. One out, Gagney is the hitter. Greg struggling in the series with just four hits. And yesterday he was one for five. One out, base is empty in game seven at the Metrodome. Think about Joe McGrain for a second. When Joe McGrain started the season, he's in the minor leagues. He's in Louisville on opening day. And here he is on closing day pitching for the world championship. Called up when Tudor broke his leg back in April after a good spring. The injury to Tudor got McGrain to the majors earlier than Whitey Herzog had anticipated. And he made the most of the opportunity. Dagney around the bunt and missing for strike two. He was trying to push that ball between McGrain and Lindemann. Lindemann playing deep. You can play deep with two strikes. But a good idea by Greg Gagney. He wants to push it. And it's a good thing to do against the left-handed pitcher because all left-handers fall toward third base. So that gives you an even bigger hole to bunt the ball between the first baseman and the pitcher. Oh, and to the count. One out of the bases empty. Joe McGrain has moved around in his life. His father right now teaching at Moorhead State University in Kentucky. But part of McGrain's childhood was spent in this area. And he pitched in this ballpark as a collegian. He went to the University of Arizona and faced Minnesota a couple of years ago in the Metrodome. And he gets it. Ran it down and in on Gagney. And there are two gone with Kirby Puckett coming up. And this is a point that you alluded to all series, Timmy. When you get ahead, you can make the hitter expand the strike zone. Look for this ball. It's an obvious ball, but you got to go at it. Tight spin on the breaking ball. Take another look. Makes him expand the zone, and he swings at the pitcher's pitch. That's that disappearing slider. It serves as the illusion of a strike. But it's got a late break to it, similar to the idol of Joe McGrain when he was growing up, Steve Carlton. Mm -hmm. And he finally got to meet Steve, in fact, the other night in St. Louis. He did indeed. Strike. 0 and 1. And as glib as he is, he, he was almost speechless. He really was. We, of course, were all were all there, and Joe came up to meet Steve, and he was it was just wonderful. I mean, seeing the the expression on his face, it's like a, a little nine-year-old boy meeting Steve Carlton instead of a, a guy pitching the seventh game of the World Series. Well, it's funny because a lot of players block several things out, but McGrain is the kind of guy that he knows where he is and he's relishing and trying to savor every moment. Obviously, he's thinking about it slowly toward third. Lawless throws low, scoop late. And won the count. And that's hit toward the gap in right center field, but racing over his Okendo, and he makes the catch. Great play by Jose. No score after one can this ball but you see that little loop that Okendo takes and he makes a fine running catch and as he came back to the dugout and even finer considering again the roof and also the crowd with not only the white Homer hankies but a lot of people wearing those white Minnesota Twins American League champion sweatshirts well, that's what Ozzie Smith said yesterday. He said, we haven't beaten ourselves. In fact, the Twins played worse than the, the Cardinals. What happened is they just got blown out of the ballpark. So defense so much of their game. Jim Lindemann starts the second inning by looping one into center field for a base hit. And the best way to do it is to get an early lead. They did that last night until the fifth inning.
That's line in the left for a base hit. Gladden fields on the hop. Lindemann stops at second. And so the first two Cardinals get on here in the second. Tony, so far in this series. Another fastball, though, is wrapped in the center for a base hit. Lindemann, around third, comes in to score. Stopping at second is McGee. Cardinals lead 1-0.